welcome back to the course. Uh, in the last class, we looked at the concept of J coupling, um, how the different J coupling values vary uh, between hydrogen and hydrogen and hydrogen and carbon. And these are very important uh, values because in biomolecules, we exploit this uh, J coupling uh, to design new NMR experiments, to design 2D and 3D NMR experiments, which we will see as we go along. Uh, and another concept very important in NMR is nuclear spin relaxation which what is what we will briefly look at it today. Uh, so, what happens this is something which we already covered uh, in the earlier few classes. So, typically we have this is the classical picture of NMR in which the spins are represented by the vectors the arrows and they are fanned along the x y plane that is they are fanned along a cone and the cone is pointing in the z axis. This is for the alpha state the spins which are in the alpha state and similarly with spins which are in the beta state uh, are also processing around the magnetic field, uh, but they are pointing now in minus z direction and they are also fanned out in form of a cone uh, and each vector is again uh, represents one atom, one particular atom in the molecule or one type of atom and these are different molecules. So, now if you combine these two uh, we saw that you end up with what is called a net magnetization vector which points along the z axis. So, that is what uh, we saw, uh, this is called the equilibrium magnetization. So, this is the equilibrium state and this is what the spin has to spins have to achieve uh, when you then they come back to equilibrium. So, you have to keep this picture in mind that this is how it starts with the whole process starts like this and we apply a pulse and we bring the magnetization to a x or y axis depending on the phase of the pulse. So, now this is a non equilibrium situation, the spins have been brought from z axis to x y plane. So, this now if I remove the pulse, it has to go back to this situation. So, what does it have to achieve? It has to achieve two things, it has to now this black this vector has to come back to z axis that is the net magnetization which is along z axis at equilibrium. Not only that the individual spins what happens is when you apply a pulse they are all bunched together, they are all phased together. So, we use the word coherence. So, we create a coherence that is the same phase situation for the spins. Now, when I apply this uh, when I remove the pulse the phases have to go back into this random phase uh, situation around the cone. So, that is, that is the second thing one has to achieve that is the spins have to now become decoherent or dephase. So, these are the two things that is one coming back along z axis and one dephasing in the x y plane because you see this phase dephasing these vectors are actually not dephased in the z axis they all come together in the z axis, but in the x y direction they are all phased out they are randomized. Uh, so, therefore, that is the second thing which they have to achieve and the first thing is along the z axis to recover along the z axis. So, these two different thing pathways uh, we use the word relaxation. So, relaxation is the process in which the magnetization starting from this non equilibrium position goes back into the equilibrium scenario uh, and that is now there are two phenomena as I said two different pathways or two different mechanisms. Uh, one is the z axis recovery which we use the word T 1 relaxation and the second is a dephasing or decoherence of the vectors because when you create vectors like this they are actually coherent they are together and that is not an equilibrium situation it has to recover back into the z axis and dephase out completely and that is T 2 relaxation. Now, these two parameters T 1 and T 2 play a very important role as far as the sensitivity of NMR is concerned as far as the, the, the line width of a spectrum or the peak in the spectrum is concerned. So, one has to therefore, very carefully pay attention to these two me mechanisms it's especially in biomolecules. Uh, they play a very important role and any uh, wrong understanding of T 1 and T 2 can result in a not a very good data or NMR spectra. So, let us look at this T 2 relaxation again a little bit more because this is a very important phenomenon for large molecules like proteins. Uh, here you can see again what is shown here is the non equilibrium situation, the signal is maximum along the x axis and now the spins start dephasing. So, they are dephasing in the x y plane and this is a picture we also saw in the few classes ago and now this dephasing is shown further in this manner 
So, you are looking from the z axis and you are looking in x y plane. So, this is the x y plane, this circle is in the x y direction. So, this you can think of this as the x axis and you can think of this as the y axis. So, you can see the spins are dephasing and after some period of time when you are looking from the z axis they are completely dephased. This is the end of the T 2 process. So, the T 2 relaxation is essentially if you look at it is a, is an exponential decay it exponentially goes back or goes starts from here at t equal to 0 and exponentially goes to at a long for a long time it goes into this state. So, this typically happens about 5 times the T2 value. So, if you know the T2 value of your if you are of your molecule of your proton uh, then after 3 to 5 times the T2 value this is the scenario. Uh, and this as I said is very important because this T 2 value this how fast or how slow this happens is directly related to the width of the line. So, if you look at an NMR peak, NMR peak looks something schematically like this this and then the width which we measure at half the height. So, we use the word full width at half maximum. So, full width at half the maxima that is called a line width and line width is directly related to uh, the inversely proportional to T 2. So, longer the T 2 that means, the longer the time it takes to go from here to here the narrower the smaller is the value of the line width. So, you say inverse proportionality if the T 2 is very short that means, from here to here it happens in a very short duration then this line will be broad. So, what is the consequence of a broad or a narrow narrow line in NMR spectrum? Uh, see if the line is very broad the height will go down because the area has to be constant let us say this represents one proton whether the T 2 is high or low the area should not change. So, therefore, if the line width goes high or becomes more more bigger because of short T 2 the height has to go down to compensate to make the area constant to keep the area constant. This results in a very broad line and a signal to noise goes down. So, this is what happens in biomolecules we always deal with very low signal to noise. Uh, because there the molecule size is so large uh, that the T 2 is very short. Now, the size and T 2 dependence we will take it up later uh, we also we have to use the word rotational correlation time and so on that we will introduce at a later point, but for large biomolecules the T 2 is short for small molecules remember T 2 is long and if T 2 is long the line width is sharp and if T 2 is short the line width is high. So, these are the different factors which govern the sensitivity of NMR. So, this is kind of a summary of 1D NMR how are what are the different factors which you have to keep in mind uh, when we want to increase. Uh, again remember from a point of view of biomolecules, biomolecules are very low in sensitivity. So, therefore, any any factor which improves the sensitivity is always welcome. Uh, so, starting from the very important the first thing is the concentration the sample the signal to noise or that is that is a, the sensitivity increases linearly with concentration. So, if I double the concentration I double the sensitivity of the spectrum or if I half the concentration I reduce it by half. So, the sample concentration is a very important parameter uh, typically for biomolecules we go up to about 1 millimolar, but many biomolecules cannot sustain at 1 millimolar they start precipitating in the NMR tube. So, therefore, we go down we dilute the sample uh, to 100 micromolar, 50 micromolar and so on, but as you go below 100 micromolar uh, the sensitivity drops dramatically and therefore, unless you do some kind of a special NMR technique if you do not use special NMR techniques the signal to noise will be very low and the spectrum is hardly analyzable. So, signal sample concentration is a very important parameter therefore, it is ranked number 1 as far as sensitivity is concerned. Temperature is a not a so great a parameter, but yes it is an important parameter it is it also determines sensitivity. Uh, so, what happens is uh, typically if for a biomolecule if you increase the temperature the sensitivity goes up uh, that is because the molecule now starts rotating or tumbling very fast faster relatively and that improves the line width meaning the line width reduces. So, if the line width reduces your signal to noise goes up. So, temperature can be a helpful parameter at times, but again temperature increase in temperature is not always possible this biomolecule may start degrading uh, at even at room temperature many biomolecules are not stable 
So, we have to decrease the temperature, go below room temperature. Uh, but if you go below room temperature, the problem is the sample starts, the signal starts little bit broadening. So, if you go to very low temperature like 5 degrees or 4 degrees, the signal to noise drops. So, if your sample is stable at room temperature, that is ideal situation. If it is stable in a higher temperature, that is very good. Uh, but if it is not, then at least at room temperature or near room temperature, what would be an, a good condition for as far as temperature is concerned. Uh, magnetic field strength plays again a very important role. Now, you can see here the signal to noise goes up as B0 or magnetic field to the power 3 by 2. So, it is not just linear, it is t to the power. So, if when I go from 400 to 800 megahertz, I do not double, just double the, the sensitivity, the sensitivity goes more than double because it is to the power 3 by 2. So, therefore, it is one of the reason why a lot of research has gone into building a higher and higher magnetic field. Uh, and you can see, you can see in literature or you can see in, in, in industry, uh, there are now 1.2 gigahertz NMR spectrometers getting ready and this is one of the highest, this is highest field strength as of today. And that is because of this factor that any increase in magnetic field brings about a very high increase in sensitivity. Not only sensitivity, it also brings about improvement in resolution, uh, which is not listed, this is not the factors, I mean resolution is not been discussed in this slide, uh, but that is also a very important uh, gain hap which happens with high, but a high field magnet, high magnetic field also has some negative uh, drawbacks, some drawbacks which we will not discuss now, we will see that as we go to the biomolecular part. Now, what is important is the, what type of nucleus use you are observing. Uh, proton is always the best uh, nucleus, it has a maximum sensitivity as an, and carbon is uh, not so great, it is less 4 times. Nitrogen in fact, nitrogen 15 is 10 times less, so proton is always the best. Uh, but in biomolecules, you cannot just rely on hydrogen proton unlike in organic molecules. Uh, so, you need carbon and nitrogen. Uh, so, we as we see, we will see how to improve the sensitivity uh, if we are using carbon and nitrogen. Uh, that will will cover under heteronuclear NMR uh, spectroscopy. The probe, the, this is something which is hardware related. Uh, we had we are not gone into the hardware aspect in this course. I would suggest or recommend to go through the books uh, or the previous course, which was uh, in which we covered the hardware part in detail. So probe is essentially the part of the NMR system or spectrometer where actually the sample is placed and it receives the energy and it emits the signal back to the probe. So, this special type of probes which are available today, uh, we use the, we use cryogenic probes and they have high sensitivity uh, and for biomolecules these days is by default at high magnetic field combination of a high magnetic field and cryogenic probe is what is used for biomolecular studies. So, typically people use 600, 700, 800 megahertz NMR that is higher magnetic field with cryogenic probes. Uh, the, the last point which is again an important point is that it the, your sensitivity, how strong is your signal or spectrum uh, depends on how much time was used to record the data. So, if you use a very short duration and uh, that is the number of time averaging or scans, if you use less your signal to noise will be low. If you increase the number of scans, uh, your signal to noise will go up. So, signal to noise is again proportional to the square root of time. So, this is an important point here which should be noted. Suppose I double my or if I increase the measurement time from 1 hour to 4 hours, my signal to noise will not go up 4 times, it will go up by square root of 4, 4 by 1 which is 4 and square root of 4 is 2. So, if I quadruple, if I increase my signal uh, measurement time by 4 times, my signal to noise goes up only by 2 times. So, you can see the square root is important. So, if I increase the measurement time 10 times, so if I record a spectrum instead of 1 hour, I record for 10 hours, my signal to noise will go up only by square root of 10, which is 10, 3.6, 3 point something. So, this is basically the, the, the way to look at how the signal to noise can be improved. There are different parameters and which is very important to keep all this in mind as you go along. Now, this is again, this is just a summary of how NMR, 1D NMR spectrum is recorded. So, we, we looked at how the sample and the sample is then put it in a magnet the, and we apply radio frequency pulse. This is the resonance part 
uh, which is applied in the frequency with appropriate frequency and then the signal which comes out from the this molecules the sample is collected and as an as an FID which decays with time and it is digitized and after digitization it is processed with Fourier transform and that gives you the final spectrum. So, the all the signals which are present in this signal uh, there are many different frequencies which could be present are now presented or separated in the frequency domain and this domain is a frequency domain signal or a spectrum and that is converted into a ppm scale or represented in a ppm scale for analysis. So, when we look at higher uh, an MR 2D and 3D uh, as we go along we, we have to understand how an experiment and 1D NMR experiment and 2D NMR experiment are built. So, this is what is called as a pulse sequence. A pulse sequence is like a blueprint. Uh, it tells you that what are the things parameters which are important in a NMR experiment. So, although we will not go into detail of each and every parameter here, uh, we, have, we need to understand what comes first, what are the different words or uh, the, the terminologies which are used because when we go to 2D NMR shortly, uh, we will have we will be referring to these terminologies. So, a 1D NMR essentially begins with a preparation period. This period is what is called as a equilibration period. So, you have put the sample and you wait for some time for it to equilibrate and this is of the order of the T1 of the sample. Uh, once the sample has equilibrated uh, then you apply the pulse. When you apply the pulse the signal the molecules are excited. So, that is why we use the word excitation pulse. Uh, this is a 90 degree pulse, 90 degree pulse causes excitation remember and the 180 degree causes inversion. So, we are now looking at excitation. Uh, once the signal uh, the excitation is pulse is over the FID the signal now starts getting collected in the detector and that is F free induction decay and that portion of time when we collect the signal uh, we use the word acquisition time. So, acquisition is the duration for which the NMR signal the FID is collected. Uh, this is why we call detection of signal and once the signal detection is over we repeat this whole experiment again by going back to this point here and that this whole process is repeated uh, n number of times and that is called as scans. This is what is shown in the next slide here. So, this is what I showed the pulse sequence for a 1D experiment. So, you have before you apply a pulse you have an equilibration time that is called relaxation delay and that is of the order of few seconds and this depends on the T1 of the sample remember. So, if the T1 is long you need a longer time, if T1 is short you need a shorter time you do not need to wait long time. And then you apply the pulse which is again duration of few microseconds, it can be also few milliseconds depending on the selectivity which, which we will go into detail later. Uh, so, once a pulse is applied and removed the signal which is the FID is collected and that FID is now the acquisition time, the time it takes for the FID to go to 0. So, this time which is about few, uh, 100 milliseconds to a few seconds. Now, this depends on the T2 of the sample. So, the FID depends on the T2, the length of the FID or the duration for which it is collected and the relaxation delay is before the pulse that depends on the T1. So, T1 and T2 play a very important role in signal process, this, uh, acquisition. Now, once the signal is detected as I mentioned you go back to this and repeat this n number of times and that is basically called as scans. So, if you do a single scan the experiment is over at this point, if you do multiple scans you do multiple times, but each time you have to go back to here not just before the pulse you have to wait again for the equilibration to take place before you apply a pulse. So, this is this process uh, of a 1D NMR experiment and we will see as we go to 2D NMR. Uh, this will this kind of a picture or diagram will be repeated. So, therefore, it is important to understand this concept which was covered also in detail in the previous course and also is covered nicely in many different uh, test books. So, before we end 1D NMR uh, important nucleus which comes in biomolecular NMR is carbon 13. So, let us look at carbon 13 NMR uh, spectroscopy now what is special about carbon 13. Uh, carbon 13 uh, is uh, carbon 12 as we know does not have a spin uh, that is i equal to 0 because it has even atomic number and even atomic mass. But carbon 13 which is isotope of carbon has a spin value half because it is odd mass. 
So, but the problem with carbon 13 that is that there are two uh, issues, one is the, the gamma the, that is the gyromagnetic ratio is 4 times less compared to protons. Not only that the second problem is also compounding the whole issue is that the natural abundance means how many carbon 13 atoms are present in a molecule is small is about 1 percent which means 1 percent out of 100 or 1 out of 100 atom in a molecule or in a collection of molecules will be C13. But then why do we have to use carbon 13 at all that is because of this single factor that is uh, this range chemical shift range is very large. You can see it goes up to 200 ppm in biomolecules it can go even up to 300 in case of inorganic or organic molecules, but 200 ppm is a very large dispersion or resolution which is achievable with carbon 13 uh, and also it carries lot of interesting structural features which can be useful for biomolecules. So, carbon 13 although it, these are the two problems uh, it is still uh, used very popularly and the first problem here which is the abundance can be dealt with using isotope labeling which is what we will cover in this course for biomolecules we can make a molecule fully carbon 13 labeled in which case it will be 100 percent of all carbons will become C13 no longer 1 percent. So, 1 percent is a natural abundance case I take on any molecule from nature, but I can artificially enrich the molecule with C13 using special techniques especially in biomolecules we use biological techniques and that will result in 100 percent carbon 13. So, the first problem is completely taken care um, by using this method of isotope labeling whereas, the second problem remains this is again a difficult to handle, but this also can be removed by heteronuclear NMR techniques uh, which we will see when we come to 2D NMR. So, both this problem can be tackled and the reason for the motivation for doing that is this huge range. So, let us see what are the different uh, frequencies at which carbon resonates for a given proton frequency. So, this is very simple to calculate. So, this is the magnetic field shown here for hydrogen I mean for a for a magnet and for hydrogen the frequency corresponding to that magnetic field is shown here. So, this comes from the equation omega equal to gamma into B0. So, B0 is given gamma we know for proton so we can calculate omega. So, these are the different values for different magnetic field for carbon it is just 4 times less because carbon also has the same equation omega equal to gamma into B0, but now the gamma is 4 times less compared to proton. So, therefore, its gyromagnetic ratio is 4 times less. So, its frequency will become 4 times less. So, you can see for a 500 megahertz in a spectrometer your carbon 13 will come at 125 megahertz frequency. Okay. So, similarly for 600 it becomes 150 and for 800 is 200. So, we essentially divide the hydrogen frequency by 4 times to obtain the, chem the frequency of carbon 13. So, what is the implication of this? The implication of this is on the sensitivity. Remember gamma I we showed in the very first or second class is a factor which determines the sensitivity by through Boltzmann equation. So, because of 4 times less gamma the, the sensitivity of carbon and the polarization or the population difference of carbon is also less, but this is where the advantage of carbon comes in. You can see the different the range the huge range of chemical shift variations possible in carbon 13. So, it varies from 8 almost 0 ppm where the initial the first 20 30 ppm belong to this methyl groups. Uh, methyls um, are very strong NMR they give very very strong NMR signals both in carbon 13 and proton and they are very easy to identify and they come around this region then comes methylene in pro amino acids in proteins, then comes methane and then there is kind of a gap normally you do not see anything up to 80 p 70 to 80 and that is where the, the amino acids which are attached to oxygen uh, the carbons in the amino acid attached to oxygen come uh, in this range. In biomolecules of we are not concerned with chlorine and bromine and similarly we in biomolecules we do not worry about alkynes. So, this particular zone in biomolecules from 35 to 90 or sorry from 80 to about 100 or 120 is a kind of empty. We do not see anything in this zone because these species are not present in biomolecules. So, biomolecules typically we go up to 80 and then we next the region which is of interest is the aromatic because of amino acids which are aromatic in nature. There 
uh, peaks start appearing at between 110, 120 to 140. So, aromatic region is another region of importance. Then another very important region is the carbonyl and this carbonyl in case of proteins comes from amides. So, we are looking at somewhere like 170, 165 to 175 or 180 ppm in this range for the carbonyl. Uh, we will not normally get peaks so downfield that is between 180 to 200 in proteins, but for organic molecules this is an important zone. So, carbon 13 NMR spectrum is therefore very useful, it has a wide range. So, we can actually look at the, the spectrum and identify the different functional groups which are present in the, the system. So, this is again a broad range of chemical shifts given for carbon. So, single bond is somewhere between 0 to 50, carbon oxygen, uh, the carbon attached to oxygen come around this range, car double bond within the aromatics and carbonyl in this range. So, one thing uh, very important in carbon 13 NMR is if there is a coupling between two carbons. So, naturally there is going to be a coupling because both are NMR active. So, if there are two carbons attached to each other, it is possible. But then the, the thing is there is the abundance of carbon and natural abundance is very low. So, if this is 1 percent uh, abundance, this is also 1 percent. So, what is the chance that you will encounter two carbon 13 next to each other and that chance is 1 percent of 1 percent that is very, very low and therefore, carbon 13, carbon 13 coupling will never come in the spectrum unlike protons. Uh, where it is very conspicuous when an NMR spectrum of proton as we saw uh, shows very nice doublets, triplets and so on. But if you record a carbon 13 1D NMR, you will hardly notice any carbon carbon coupling at natural abundance. But this is no longer the situation if you have a C13 enriched biomolecules like in proteins when I will, will show go through the isotope labeling part, we, we are essentially focusing on completely making all the carbon in the molecule as carbon 13. In such a scenario, your coupling is going to be present. So, carbon carbon coupling at natural abundance is not a problem, no not probable, but in carbon 13 enriched molecules, it is definitely a problem which one has to consider when designing experiments. We will see that how we when we go along, uh, but carbon 13 definitely couples to hydrogen irrespective of whether it is enriched or not enriched because every carbon 13 will most likely be attached to a proton unless the quaternary, but you will have this uh, carbon 13 attached to hydrogen and hydrogen is 100 percent NMR active in abundance. So, any these two are now magnet two uh, uh, NMR active nuclei, so they will start coupling, nobody can stop it from coupling. So, this coupling now is uh, strong coupling about 100 to 200 hertz and that coupling will now possible you can see in the spectrum. So, if you record a carbon 13 spectrum, you may see a coupling to proton unless we remove that coupling. So, that is what is important to understand. So, let us look at first how the patterns will come. This is similar to what you see in proton NMR. If you have a carbon 13 attached to 3 hydrogens, it will be n plus 1, 4 that is that n plus 1 rule. Similarly, if it attached to 2, it will be a triplet, a doublet and a singlet. So, this is similar to what we saw in the case of protons, hydrogens that if hydrogen is attached to one hydrogen, it shows a doublet, if it attached to two triplet and so on. So, this can be a problem because you see the sensitivity goes down. Each time you record a splitting uh, or get a splitting, the sensitivity goes down by half. So, that causes a problem and that increases the complexity also because instead of one peak, uh, now I start seeing many peaks. So, the, very, the standard technique which is used uh, to remove such couplings between carbon and hydrogen is called as decoupling. So, decoupling is a technique in NMR to remove the J coupling between a carbon and hydrogen in a carbon NMR experiment. Decoupling is a general word, it can be also used for carbon carbon decoupling, carbon nitrogen decoupling or any any two nuclei if you want to decouple, we use our decoupling. So, in carbon 13 NMR, it is essentially uh, a, a technique where we apply a continuous RF irradiation, a RF uh, energy to a given spin A and then the nuclei starts jumping between the two because you are applying RF and that results in decoupling. So, we will not go into the details of decoupling in this course, um, but this has been covered uh, in, the, in many books. 
And the idea basically is which you have to understand and take home is that carbon 13 appears now as a singlet because we have removed its coupling to the J coupling to proton. We can also do this with other nucleus carbon 13 with nitrogen or carbon 13 with another carbon 13 which we will see when we go to biomolecules. So, this brings us to the end of the 1D NMR spectroscopy. Uh, we will now move on to 2D NMR uh, and we will see how now the different homonuclear and heteronuclear 2D NMR uh, experiments are conducted and analyzed.